Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. Partner up with Navy Federal to pay down credit card debt. You can learn more at NavyFederal.org. So that's what gave me the confidence that w- was one of us. Not only that, but Marcus, uh, falling back on his training, at least to me, it appeared that he was running a military crest, which um, is part of our, you know, kind of like this is a maneuver that you use to, sh- to uh, assure, you know, that you have a minimum signature. Whether you're uphill or downhill from somebody, that military crest um, kind of hides your movement you know, from the enemy. And generally speaking, uh, if you're running a military crest, you're on the run. You're evading. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you're moving into a target, and that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. Right? Correct. So um, one of the big... That's why they call it that. Yeah. So one of the big frustrations that um, you know we're going to have in the, all of this is we have absolutely no idea what equipment has been captured. Mm-hmm. We have no idea what equipment you know they've retained. We have no idea how many survivors. There's a lot of unknowns. What we do know at this point is that there was a cell phone call made, a sat phone call made, and there was a, a, a helicopter burning, mm-hmm. right? With a whole bunch of Americans that, you know, their plans changed dramatically that mm-hmm. night. A lot of families. And so we had some things we needed to do. Um, so we coordinated with uh, the task force and our PJ team there. Um, we sent some folks up to the mountain. And uh, we sent some folks to... Uh, look over the ambush site, and then we send some folks to the crash site. So you're saying by air, by air, they're looking by down. any means. Ne- no, uh, well, yes, by air, mm-hmm. um, in the like as it's occurring, because you know, if you've got the 47 yeah, still resp- going, yeah, the 47 yeah. is responding, and because it's responding, other people now are sl- they're, they're game on, mm-hmm. right? So they're looking. So you have A-10s flying, and they're looking, they're squawking. Mm-hmm. You've got Apaches flying, Cobra's they're right, looking. Cobra's right there. And, you know, you, and so there's this, you know, like, at some point, it, it's, it's just open kimono. Like, mm-hmm. we don't care about, you know, noise signatures and, and radios and all that kind of, it's bring our people home, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's, it's wide open. There's no secrets anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the environment that we transition from a, from a, Special operations, clandestine surveillance and reconnaissance to it's wide open. Let's get all our people that's back. Fight. Yeah, that's, that's a, a freaking fight. I mean, yeah. like we try to do all this sexy underground black cops kind of stuff, man. But when that one went down, it's like, hey, yeah. you want some? We'll, we'll bring it. Yep. And, and everybody showed up. I have a side <laughs> question, which uh-huh. wasn't um, this wasn't discovered until like two weeks later when they found Matt Axelson's body. It They found it far away from the um from where they were where they were all fighting and and where uh, mikey and danny had died and it they had gotten separated from an um rpg blast mm-hmm. kind of off of the he went one um, way. yeah he went one way marcus went the other it is thought or, or rumor talked about that axe actually lived through that blast longer than what we thought what marcus thought you know marcus thought he's got to be dead Mm. and he he's going the opposite way than matt went but because of where he was found and i think if i remember correctly and i might not be and if i'm not i'm extremely sorry to whoever would be mad at this information but um from what i was told and what i remember he had um made it close to a village like another village um and and it ended up being shot and killed and then a villager had like took his body even further away and buried it did you get any beacons from him or was it just from marcus so you know that's a great question mel um and i i have to be real careful here because you know, um, there's a lot of the 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 short story is we don't know. Okay. Um, that's that's the right answer. Uh, yeah, you want to know? There's there's so many opinions. Mm-hmm. Um, you have people that piece things together, and they be may may be completely right, mm-hmm. but we have no way to validate it. And I think that's where the the questions come about a lot of this circumstances. Yeah. The best record we have 
is of Marcus's memory. Mm -hmm. And there are other things, uh, including like the cell phone call, where um, I got information that it was a different person that made the phone call. Um, and I asked them, and this has, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to disparage anybody's uh, mm -hmm. memory or, uh, or undermine s someone's heroism. Mm -hmm. But I asked multiple times, how do you know it was the individual that, that you were telling me on the other end of the line? I'm looking for, remember now, like we're trying to, you know, match names with right. personal identification records. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're running a complete log mm -hmm. of every single person that's on the side of that mountain. We want a complete accountability of every bit of the kit, everything. Mm -hmm. So every detail. So backtracking and saying, okay, I want to know who received the phone call. I want to talk to him. Mm -hmm. All right, you tell me who made that phone call. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I'm really sure that it was so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay. And then, you know, years later, um, or, you know, it, it turns out that it was somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, you ask me who made the phone call, I don't know. Yeah. I, I didn't hear the phone call, and I wouldn't know because right. I wasn't I wasn't present. I They weren't my teammates. Mm -hmm. And when I asked the gentleman, hey, did you when you how do you know it was this guy it's like i know this guy is my friend mm -hmm. okay i trust you so that's what i logged down so in retrospect that became a different name mm -hmm. at some point in the record i i don't know what happened i all i can tell you is what i was told mm -hmm. the same thing with the bodies um one of the things that uh many americans don't know is that the uh our enemy um did a phenomenal job of recovering their own remains. Um, and you could, you know, like we had, there's a ton of stories out there of guys, you know, uh, shooting up a whole bunch of bad guys mm -hmm. and go out there, to you know, to, you know, to cover, recover the bodies, you know, over distance. And it's like, they're all gone. Where'd they go? Mm -hmm. You know, it's somehow or another, they were able to, you know, get them off the side of a mountain and carry them away. Yeah. We do the same thing. You yeah. know? So could it be possible that his remains were moved? You know, uh, maybe uh, as a result of them trying to get to his equipment or something, mm -hmm. it's possible. Is it possible that he made his way there mm -hmm. um, and eventually succumbed to his wounds? Right? That's possible too. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from a rescue perspective, uh, we tend to shy away from speculation. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when we arrive on a scene and it's, 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 the evidence supports the fact they were still alive. Mm -hmm. um, we had a we had an aircraft crash in the in the Hindu Kush, uh, a uh, other governmental agency bird, um, and they were absolutely convinced that everybody was killed in the crash. But then when our PJs got up to the side of the mountain up in the snow, we found guys with cigarette butts lined up as they were, you know, waiting to be rescued, mm -hmm. and they just you know we didn't get there in time. So those are very, very difficult stories to hear, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the families. So we tend to be like pretty factual when we speak about things like this. And Mel, I just, I can't answer it. Yeah. And it's not that it would change anything. It's just that, you know, line of curiosity, like what, when you hear different people's perspectives. Oh, you won't know. Like how's you know, your way over there? Yeah. It's like okay. how, you know, was he being tracked too? Because that was something I've always wondered and never knew and I am very close to the widows um yeah. so it it's a not I didn't know them I met Marcus five years after um Operation Red Wing happened um so but I feel like I know them yeah. because I oh, you feel their I pain feel their pain and I truly love the women yeah um we named our son Ax after Matt Axelson so he was born on Mikey's birthday yeah so <laughs> wow yeah there's there's a lot of uh, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so. How about that, huh? <laughs> um, I mean, we we love these men and the women, the families that are behind them. So, yeah. um, I I always just have that curiosity um, to just talking to different people that had a piece of the puzzle of whether it was rescue or um, that was you know there's so many people that were involved in this mission in different um aspects whether it was flying a bird or on the ground taking intel or whatever there's it, so many different people that the were world involved. becomes pretty small um, yeah after the operation i'll share this with you mel after the operation to recover the remains uh 
I was in the tactical operations center for the PJs uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, I was with Marcus. Um, you remember when we met? Of course you do. I mean, I... Uh, yeah, I think so. I don't know if you remember. I was, plane, in, right? I was in huh? When, and then in the bus, right, when I got the plane? Yeah. yeah. You were in there, right? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. I must have looked worse than I thought because I remember that girl crying real bad at the at the ramp, and then we had the, we walked down to the bus. I wanted to ask me if I was hungry, or the skipper did. Hold on. Y'all are skipping up. Yeah, yeah, we're skipping something. some bunk. Yeah. So uh, what I was going to say is that um, the PJs that were involved in the recovery operation, there's a lot of things that we did um, to support Marcus while he was evading. Um, you know, we got into report, we got into the kind of locate. Um, the next phase is support. We, uh, we drop resupply bundles all over the side of the mountain in a specialized pattern. That was one of the things that I came up with was, uh, you know, the, the pattern to use and how the dispersion pattern and all that. Uh, so the guys dropped that on my order. Um, and then, uh, there were some other things we did with your radio. Um, I remember, you know, to kind of, you know, try to find you. I was getting you. my intel and then trying to do the best I could to yeah. follow the rules. Oh, you felt, you, yeah, yeah. I was just. Yeah, know. if there's ever, I, you know, if, if we ever get, uh, may, maybe one of the great things is that uh, I, in in the course of preparing for this, um, I had someone suggest that I, I write it all down and then pass it through some, uh, you know, the JPRA and see if I can get some of this released. Because um, I think the American public would find it completely fascinating um, how, what, to what efforts um, our government will go to to bring their people. It was the best. Yeah. All so I, I you were like sending like Morse code or hole. what through the radio? Oh, you can't even believe what we were doing. Yeah. You just can't even believe yeah. it. They yeah. would come up with ideas there's, there's that a, you can't even possibly yeah, think of. I, I can't get into it because, <laughs> I, I, you know, a lot of this, I didn't even know they existed until one of them showed up and I was like, I think I understand. Yeah. And I would do something and it would work. And I'd be like, and then I do something else, and it wouldn't, and then it was kind of weird. Yeah, so the support um, phase um, kicks in a whole bunch of different uh, ways. Um, you know, support can come in many ways, right? So um, a lot of them could be moral support. Mm -hmm. So we can't necessarily get you out, but we can communicate with you and let you know you're not alone, mm -hmm. right? We've got an eye on. And it's that was the biggest thing. I was like, I, once I knew that sucker had an eyeball on me, I was like, come on. Yeah. Like, oh, it's just a matter of time. Hey, yeah. It's like, oh, my boys got me now. Yeah. Like, once they, I knew they saw me and where I was, that's that's what changed your team guy. And how did you know that? What moment was that? Oh, I got something. Yeah. I got a little gift. <laughs> Showed up. But so Can you say that? Can you say I what it did. was? I know, but what was a gift? It was a gift. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. Some of this stuff. So, so part of, um, you know, there's, there's various different uh, mechanisms that we employ. Um, you know, it, it could very well be, let, let's give you a great example. Um, what if you had the ability to, we knew that there was a television, you know, close by, you know, and uh, you were held in a foreign country. It could be so much as just a, a message on the television, mm -hmm. seeing an American flag, you know, and somebody saying, you know, we miss you. Can't mm -hmm. wait for you to come home. You know, that kind of a thing. And that could build. Something that somebody else will overlook. Yeah. Completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, you know, the, the, this discrete method of communication is employed by our adversaries as well. Um, and so, you know, we have tradecraft and, you know, we have skillcraft and a bunch of other things that are uh, mechanisms that we employ to this day. So um, some of them are so effective that we continue to use them. And so we don't want to give away any of that. Yeah, I don't definitely don't want to yeah. be the cause of giving away any secretive information that can yeah. help somebody else. All right, um, so just think about all of our Americans. Think about the people who play in the military. I'm only using it like this for a reason. Yeah. Think about the stuff you come up with in your head. We actually get a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think so, I mean, that also shows to to our Amer an Amer any American, if you're ever in a situation and you see some little slight hint that you're like, Hmm. Is hope. that a sign? Yeah, it's hope. That's it all needed. Be, it's all needed. It may actually be a sign. You know, I think this will resonate with mostly uh, everyone. And if you can think of the worst day of your entire life and how despondent you can be, that's every day in captivity. Mm -hmm. That's every day. You don't know if you're going to live five more minutes. You don't. You have no control over that any. Sucked, and, and and so any anything whatsoever is a morale boost, like freedom 
and uh, it, it, it is so powerful it, and, it, and it can steal the resolve of your ability to maintain professionalism, mm -hmm. you know, and courage mm -hmm. in an environment where most people will quit, right? And I mean, like, there is a point in captivity where we all will quit, mm -hmm. you know, or will die. And so it's a matter of your ability to resist that temptation to quit and endure. And so Marcus represents something that is unique in the sense of his isolation. You know, we, we have very few POWs coming out of these wars. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we didn't have, we, we had some captives um, in Iraq, but we didn't have a, like I think Marcus might be one of the only ones that had a full evasion. Then he was um, held by partisans. You know, and so was he a POW? Technically, he wasn't held by the adversary. Mm -hmm. So, no. Right. But was he free? No. no, he wasn't either. So he was isolated. And so there's a lot of things that legally, the gray area. legally that, that plays into. <laughs> right. That's where I live. And so um, <laughs> what his actions are and our actions, like there's some, you know, some rules to play by there. Mm -hmm. So did the Pepsi bottle come from you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, that was not a gift. That was that, that was, was not a gift. Yeah. <laughs> For anyone who's read, the I mean, book. I, everyone knows that's a running joke. I can't believe I don't have a Pepsi sponsor. Know. You know what yeah, saying? right. Where are you, Pepsi? I know. What the hell? For anyone so, that's read the book, I just had to dang, ask that question. Dang that freaking bottle! <laughs> yeah, that that became a campaign a few years later. Bucky uh, Buteau, Steve Buteau, who's uh, General Buteau now. He uh, put together a campaign financed by our local bar uh, there in, in Al Udeed called The Muff. And uh, I think he got together like 3,000 water bottles and put straps on them and everything and try to fly them in and drop them to, your, to the folks that helped you. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it was a whole campaign. I, I would throw that wow. thing off the mountain and show back up. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Was it the gift that they were trying to share? No, that wasn't the... America was I mean, I guess it was because there was water in it, but I mean, the water itself, I pay, I'm still paying for that. You know what I'm talking about? They're yeah. probably trying to kill me. Yeah. Now that I think about it. <laughs> well, you, you did a good job. You, of, know what I mean? probably trying you to did kill a good job of, of doing some other things. We'll, we'll get to you. But well, um, I want to finish this piece up. When I was there, uh, the PJs came in from the bird after recovering the last of the remains. And uh, I have... It takes a lot to beat a PJ down. Uh, we're fairly resilient and the face of this PJ, our, our team leader came, he comes to the door and I, 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 I'm pretty sure it was Scott Duffman, uh, who's deceased now, but, um, I looked him in the eye and I said, how you doing? And he looked at me, he said, sir, if you had to climb that mountain, I mean, it told me to climb the mountain one more time, I would have quit. Mm. And that's the only time in my entire career I ever heard a PJ mention quitting. Mm. The only time. Wow. That's how much of an effort it was to locate your teammates. I heard a SEAL senior chief say the same thing. He's like, if I could, I can't get out of here. No. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would quit. Yeah. But you, even if you quit, you still got to get the hell out of there. Yeah. So you, you can't. You might as well stay. You gotta, yeah, you can't do it. You can't, yeah. I mean, it, it traps yeah. you in there. We all yeah. got trapped on that, bro. It was, uh, you know, for those that don't know what scree is like in that kind of an environment, it's like, uh, it's almost like quicksand. And you can't, in the, the angle of attack that you guys were at, um, it's just, it, like. It's a perfect storm. Uh, it's the worst. Dro perfect storm that drops in. And everything would go wrong, then the wet with the. You know, you guys, you know, they had an elevated position on you. And so at, from that point, I mean, if anybody, you know, you ever been skiing uh, in Colorado or something, like, you know, or maybe seen some really, uh, you know, rugged mountains that's what we're talking about we're talking about the hindu kush like the most rugged mountains in the world uh, alexander quit there yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, was that the yeah. yeah there you go he, he even he was like no yeah this is uh no not gonna happen yeah so we wound up in that had to take a helicopter in there so this support phase um lasted for a while because you were um held you were isolated for a while and so we brought a lot of resources to bear um to try to support you while you were in captivity um, part of that support was to reduce or dissuade the enemy from gaining entry. Yeah. Um, that did a good job on that. Yeah. So one of the targets, I think your primary target, he, uh, he, he, um, he disappeared, yep. uh, through an airstrike 
And then, um, so after that airstrike, uh, there was some other bad guys around, yeah. and they came to visit him and find out what happened to his house, and they they ended up um, dying in a subsequent airstrike, um, which was cons- you know anybody could, would come anywhere near me, y'all get rid of them. Yeah, that yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, not everyone. Uh, there's I'm sorry, a couple I, you from, know what I mean, though. The yeah, yeah, there's a couple guys I can handle the rest. I just can't yeah. handle that the big part. Yeah, that, that that's kind of like uh, um, the Navy had done the same thing. Uh, the Air Force and the Navy have a long running. Uh, relationship going all the way back to Bat 21, at least as far as I know. And so uh, I seal Hamilton, uh, Bat 21, was uh, downed in uh, northern Vietnam, and uh, he was rescued by a Navy SEAL, Norris, yeah. and uh, won the Congressional Medal of Honor for it. Mm-hmm. I saw the movie when I was a kid. And growing up, you know, in that environment, I swore if I'd ever get a chance to pay the Navy back, I would. True story, I swear, on my life. That guy helped bring me up, Tommy, him and Mike. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've known so him my whole life. The crazy thing is, after this whole event happened, I had long hair, and I needed, uh, not that it's not long now, but I needed to get back in regs. Uh, so I went to go get a haircut in Tucson, Arizona. And I showed up at this barbershop I'd never seen before, uh, Jean's Barbershop. And it turns out that uh, when I went, went in, there's this memorabilia, like some old worn out combat boots, uh, aviation boots. And uh, a stick, you know, like the, the top of a stick out of an airplane, a helmet, and some other crap. And uh, this is all beat down, terrible stuff. It's terrible condition. And I was like, man, yeah, that's, that looks well worn. That almost looks like, hmm, what is this poster? Bat 21. Wow. So I sit down and I'm like, hey, uh, y- you know anything about this guy? He's like, oh, yes, I see Hamilton is my best friend. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. So I sit there and he goes, hey, you know, what, what do you do? I'm like, oh, you know, I do this thing in the Air Force and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, really? He's like, have you done anything cool? And I was like, uh, well, as a matter of fact, I just got involved in this mission. And, uh, you know, we pulled this Navy SEAL out of Afghanistan. He's like, no shit. So he leaves. He comes back, hands me a golf club. Number one driver out of ICL Hamilton's golf bag. He had just passed away and left his golf clubs, which ah. if you know anything about his rescue, that's how he affected his rescue. Because he had a radio that was in the clear, a PRC-90. Yeah. And he would tell the aircraft above him, hey, I'm like at Hickam, yeah. hole He's eight, dog leg right yeah. yeah. It's cool when our guys do that. Yeah. Like you'll hear guys talking about football teams or golf references. Everyone's like, how do you guys get trained up? Like some of that stuff, we wing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is straight up wing it. Yeah, yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. But they, so, the, the foreigners don't understand that. No, no, they don't no. understand that language. They'll, they'll, they'll brief themselves and come up on everything we do tactical wise, and then that's what we'll like hit them a with that. Football play. Or oh, yeah, we'll kill them with yeah. that. That's yeah. crazy. Pure American talk. Yep. So I had something that kind of I had, and I just forgot. All right, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, that support phase, the recovery phase uh, is fairly straightforward. You, you know, have told the story over and over again. Well, real quick, I do have mm-hmm. a question. Sure. Um, did you get intel from the marine base that a note from marcus had been delivered so i did gloss over a couple things uh we didn't talk about it so uh the map that i mentioned that Mm -hmm. i created um i gave it to my boss and i said hey i think this is what i have um and he's like okay cool yep for sure that's uh i need you to come talk to somebody so i have no at that point you know i'm a kind of a my familiarity with special operations is just kind of like a, you know, um, I understood a aspect of our special operations forces, but I didn't understand the full, um, all the components. And I was not read into that, uh, that program. Um, so uh, I ended up going up into the old man's called the battle cab, right? He's a three-star general up there. He's in charge of all the air forces and stuff. But off the side of his little private, you know, is another private room. There's a couple of them, you know, one of them would be like other governmental agency folks. And then there'd be these other guys. And, uh, you know, when you knock on their door and they go, who is it? You know, like mm-hmm. you're like, oh, we these guys yeah, clearly guys. have an attitude, you know, like get <laughs> yeah, away from here. Guys. I'm going to shoot through the door. Right. You know, like, OK. And uh, so, you know, uh, Bucky introduces me um, to these guys and uh, Bucky's like, hey, Jay, show him what you got. And I'm like, you know, he's kind of excited because. You know, he knows what we have um, and he knows he, he he's aware of what's going on. So he's literally watching kind of history happen. 
and he's he knows it he's aware so i hand the my my uh, map off and i'm like hey you know um and they, they're looking at it and they're like what am i looking at i'm like well this is what i have and i think i've got this and it looks like i have a single radio uh, which would indicate a single survivor and um you have it it's I have a hack here, I have a hack here, and I have a hack here. So this is time to distance. I think they're moving in this general direction. And if we give them this much time, I think we can predict that they're going to be here. And they were like, hold on a second. Open up a flatbed scanner. And electrons happen. And uh, there's a red phone. Picks up. There's no dialing. I'm like. It's like a Batman. Red yeah, phone, yeah. Kind of like. red phone. <laughs> Pick up the bat phone. Yeah, it's me. I just sent it to you. Uh huh. Yeah, I'll get him on an airplane. Okay, so summer is finally here, and let's face it, it's the hardest time to keep up with our wellness routines. Between all the long travel days and late nights, our sleep schedule gets disrupted, which usually leads to stress. But fear not, because I have got the secret weapon just for you. Thanks to Next Evo Naturals and their cutting edge smart sorb technology. Your CBD experience is about to be unmatched. So I've been incorporating the Next Evo Naturals into my daily routine, and the results have been astonishing. I felt less stressed. I sleep better. My favorite part about it is taking it after a workout, and the recovery has been out of this world. It's a legitimate game changer. And unlike most other CBD companies, Next Evo tests their product multiple times to ensure that you get 100% of what's on the label. That's something that you don't see too often, which I love. So why settle for anything less and upgrade to the expert? You're going to Afghanistan. I'm like, oh, okay. Where were you? I was in all you need cutter. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and it, apparently the two paths, the, the note, th there wasn't enough really to launch anything on the note, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a, you know, like verification of written language, like, Oh, we got a handwriting analysis, Marcus, you know, like, well, we got to hold this up and you got to, th that takes time mm -hmm. to validate. So it could be anyone writing a note. My right. name is Marcus Luttrell, you know, he could be dead and they could be, a, it could be a spoof, it could be a trap. Mm -hmm. So there's all this, you know, everybody's second guessing it, right? Um, the Marines are the kind of people that are like, I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. Here's how this goes down. If they're good or bad, they're coming home with us. <laughs> you know? yeah. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. And, and that's damn, that's dude. how that's how Jessica Lynch's 507th and those guys got recovered because that's the Marine mentality. And you know what? They're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't give a damn how many there are. Like, where are they at? Yeah. You know what? And that's that's why we have different components mm -hmm. of the services. Um, the Army loves to plan. Uh, and, they, they, man, they are master planners. Um, MDMP, you know, a military decision-making process. Uh, we've inherited that. Uh, the Air Force is... You know, of course, everybody is a part of the joint force, right? And how do you spell joint? A R M Y, right? <laughs> big, so, army, big green machine, man. Yeah, they ran um, everything. So, but I think effectively, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if my timeline serves me correct, the two validated one another. So we have now a location, and we have confirmation. We in have a proof of life. Some in different directions, too. Right. So, yeah. And so we have we have some radio information that we get. We've got. No kidding, like, okay, I've got this piece together. And that's what uh, led me, put me on an airplane to Afghanistan. Uh, prior to that, before we, I left to go, um, I was involved in the planning and the uh, approval process to getting our Air Force rescue assets from Kandahar all the way to Bagram in position for his recovery. So what we were looking for, the trigger for that launch was physical possession. So if I'm not mistaken, the timing works out is to, I got on an airplane as Travis was coming into you. Yep. Okay. So I arrive in Afghanistan and I get, hey, we've got all the remains, check. We've got physical possession of the survivor, check. Um, and the J3 at the time was like, I walk in um, and he's like, they're like, hey, here he is right here. And so the J3 turns around, he's like, how in the f did you get this? I have all the pipes bent to me. And I was like, uh, sir, well, I don't know if you have all the pipes, you know? <laughs> and uh, so 
and then he ended up putting me with their Intel folks um, and we pieced together everything and I kind of demonstrated to them, hey, here's maybe some additional techniques. Uh, but then, you know, it wasn't very long and we, we sent up the aircraft, the uh, Air Force rescue guys to come and get you, which is a whole other level of that? effort, right? I mean, that, hey, that's, uh, that was something different. Yeah, um, and that's them something guys. that we earned uh, flying in and out of the Hindu Kush. So for those that don't know or may not be familiar, we stripped that aircraft down. There was nothing, nothing yeah. that wasn't necessary. Rotor so and fuel. We, yeah, we were able to have um, Spanky, oh yeah, the, a pilot, one of the pilots yep. on that aircraft, that the helicopter that came in yeah. and pulled him out. Yeah, Skinny and, he, and Dave. Yeah, Gonzo. he explained how they had to like dump fuel and. Just really strip the yeah. Land at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you know, media or uh, high or That's came air in, density, altitude, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that kind of thing. Yeah, so that um, that kind of operation is an extremist, uh, but we do have um, we we've done it before. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we land on the side of the mountain and recover the uh, the guys from the um, aircraft crash. Okay. You know, uh, Anaconda too, right? Uh, Anaconda as well, and Amiri is like a one wheel kind of hover thing yeah, where you put the, the yep. So um, the recovery, the, the rescue, I, I, I like to call it a recovery, right? Um, not of remains, but of a person, because rescue would imply that we're rescuing you from our friendly forces. That's not necessarily the case. We were already rescued by Travis and his team. So this is more of a transfer, mm -hmm. um, certainly high risk. Uh, but the idea is to get you to friendly control. Uh, I mean, that was the most sketch thing you've ever seen. Yeah. Right, the weather and ever the, I mean, just, it was on. Yeah. That's, it was uh, it, awesome. I, I wish, uh, you know, if, if anyone were to kind of get an idea of what that looked like, I, you know, I, I apologize. I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know what's chronicled in the movie. But if you want to see a movie about what weather looks like, uh, you might want to watch uh, one of his other movies, which uh, was The Perfect Storm. Yeah. And that, uh, that's the chronicle of one of our other rescue crews. So that's one of the things about Lone Survivor, the movie, that wasn't, be and I think it was because of, I don't know, Pete would have to explain that, but I think it was because of like timing and money Time, budget yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But it showed like a clear day and in the middle of the day. Yeah. So that wasn't necessarily accurate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Which is the worst because yeah, that was the... Because that was such a cool piece to it, but there were so many awesome things that... It's like normally you tell a story, you, you overtell it. You know yeah. what? We didn't I've, do that. I've got, I've got we one We haven't told any of it yet. Sitting here thinking about it, we rolled a helicopter down the side of Mount Hood and trying to perform a rescue. We lost lift and... Uh, one of our CSAR helicopters. That aircraft was rebuilt and put back into service. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually in the air the day that you were re rescued. Uh, but if anybody wants to see the danger, like what we're really talking about here, you can find that on YouTube. So go take a look for that. Yeah, Mount Hood Rescue, Air Force there. Rescue. Flat okay. Um, yeah, the weather was insane that night. And that's why it took a couple of days to get in because the weather was just so bad they couldn't yeah. bring that helicopter i mean the mountain was sliding off the mountain oh yeah you know, weather that oh, was epic like the village was, yeah they you were have like, like lightning the strikes and the, <laughs> the earth shakes and things slide you <laughs> yeah. know? okay so we know that part just from spanking mm -hmm. and travis so let's talk about when the moment he meets you so um i think the first thing is uh we get you in and you need to get some you need to get a full-blown medical evaluation. Yeah. Food. Um, you want to talk through some of it? Well, where were you? So um, I had flown in, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, we ended up, I think it was in the bus, and then we ended up in some kind of a debriefing room, but which like, I had to wait for you to arrive. What base? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So we're in Bagram. Bagram. Okay. We're in Bagram. I'd already landed and got on a transfer to another plane. They had me in a gurney. Mm -hmm. And and then the land of the ramp came down. There was a myriad of buses. That's where I got picked up. Then we went to that conference. Remember they hold me up, strip me naked. That that's where all that happened, right? Ooh, they were doctoring me up. I can't I can't say I was there for that. In the, <laughs> you didn't see him naked. That was yeah. I, remember something because I had remember. Out trying to find the guys. And that's I went there right. before the shower and the food and the priest and all that. They yeah. took me straight into that. For, for I, I so I remember. was there. Um, what I remember is. You needed to be taken processed 
yeah. through all of that. I was then I disengaged with you, and I was there for your initial debrief, if you recall, with a SEER specialist at Intel. So we had that that we we would call phase one yeah. reintegration, and so that information that we got from you was where are you, where was the last known coordinates, right? Can you show us on a map? Um, can you? Uh, Let's see, why would that be a conflict? So I must be missing something somewhere because if we're asking you confirmation of where everything is, then we hadn't received, we hadn't gotten everybody off the mountain. So right. I've got a no, gap somewhere. Um, so Matt Axelson wasn't, re um, he wasn't recovered he until He wasn't recovered day. until I think July 14th. Yeah, it was a few weeks. So that's, yeah. Okay, okay, right, okay. Thank the other you. Two, you guys yes, kept we, going we, in. I was still in, I remember because I was keeping me, you updated in Germany. I went back in that's there right. and kept dropping in. And my platoon yeah. came in from Iraq to Thank do you, the, C, the C star on the side you. of that mm -hmm. mountain. And then couldn't we didn't find Axe for a while. I had been moved. We went to Germany. Yeah. Remember that? And then we landed there. And that's when you started doing your deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I was doing my deal before we got there. So, one of the things that no, I'm um, like me and you. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we we I listened to you debrief the SEER specialist, and you gave like, hey, I've used these mechanisms. Um, I remember that they were like, hey, did you do this? And I was like, no, I, I did this. And they were like, well, we teach not to do that. <laughs> I was like, man, I didn't have any, I didn't have any idea. I didn't know. <laughs> so so in that debrief, I'll we never don't forget we, his face when we, I said that. Yeah, when those debriefs, what we don't do is we don't tell the survivor <laughs> that he did something wrong, right? We we don't do that. We, we want to know what you did. We want to hear the story clean all the way through from front to back, yeah. and then we just encapsulate that. We pull out whatever we need to, yeah, um, to make sure that if there's anything that uh, any mechanism that needs to be reset, God, I was so sick. anything I that needs to that. be burned. Um, that kind of stuff. But then the Intel, that initial cut from Intel goes out. Right. Right. And that's like the everybody in the theater at that point that has a clearance and need to know, they get that. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that's what happened. All this other rumor that's occurring, you know, in the news cycle and all that stuff. Oh, sure. But they, they yeah, get that's what squashes that. It does. Yeah. Everybody then calms down. Yeah, that's okay? right. Okay. So that puts a big chill on everything. Um, then... Uh, what we did is we you threw us some curveballs. So typically we want to get you we want to the 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 doctrine tells us to remove you from the sights and sounds of battle as soon as possible. So bringing you to Bagram was part of that. But how do you do that if the you know you're getting mortared, you know, and the enemy is threatening to attack and all this other kind of stuff like where it can isolate you, but that's not very helpful either. Um so the idea was to the idea is to get you to launch tool, you know, as kind of quickly as possible. But you're wanting to be part of the ramp ceremony changed everything. We hadn't processed a operator. That's right. Ever. Like not maybe since Vietnam or maybe the first Gulf War. I can't I can't recall ever seeing any debriefs of an operator. Right, and so those likely had happened, but maybe South America or something like that, some other um, AO. But that got, you know, that got caught, quashed, and so we don't, we don't really get a chance to internalize that in our training. So Marcus uh, was like, "Look, I'm not leaving here until I'm, you know, until the ceremony is over," um, which gave me some extra time. It also gave other people extra time to think about it, and it's my understanding that the there was. Uh, uh, some people in the Navy that were deeply concerned about this mission failure, right? And that's what they were calling it. And uh, the, the thing that was premature, right? So, I mean, yeah, we have SEALs that are dead, but do we know everything? Mm -hmm. like, clearly not. And, you know, we have one guy for sure. Mm -hmm. We don't know where the other guy is. Thank you for reminding me about that. Mm -hmm. um, and now is not the time to start trying to figure finger point, mm -hmm. right? So some... Some people uh, can can get carried away with wanting to know, you know, things and, and can use their rank, and we know this. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we do share um, in the training process. So what we do is we um, we have a senior ranking officer that takes charge of it, and that was not me. Um, that was Doc Dickens. How about that guy? He, yeah. I still talk to him. So Doc Dickens, uh, Carl Dickens is one of those few individuals I've ever, and I've, I've been around some fairly smart people. They're way smarter than me. 
And, uh, you know, I get a contact high, you know, and think maybe I'm smart sometimes. But Doc Dickens brings it to a whole other level. He will convince you that you are Superman. Dude, he's got this smile. He's real. And I can't explain it. <laughs> real charismatic. You don't talk about it. Like, you're the, really you're the smartest version of yourself. You're the, the you're the most passionate person of yourself. You're the fullest expression of yourself um, I, I've ever experienced. And I, I'm a faithful person. And I mean, I go to church every week, you know, and I, I, I'm every day I'm praying uh, multiple times a day. And I, I will tell you that I've never experienced anything quite like being around that man. How about that? That and freaking I, guy, man. And so he, he wouldn't let me go down. He wouldn't no, let me get no, down on myself. No. And uh, and so being part of this whole process, we, we were on a journey with him. So I did some things to facilitate um, and I, I did I made some leadership decisions. But um I feel like that if there was a, a, a father figure for all of us, it was him. Um, and he, he, he cleared some paths for us and uh, offered some suggestions at key moments that allowed us to make some decisions to, you know. Um, but one of the things that I did, uh, we, we meshed well because um, he didn't come from the background that I did. So when I said, hey, I'm concerned about this, that it was a tip off for him and he was able then to help me kind of work through hey what's the next step and i would just i had the confidence to make those decisions as a young uh, officer and um so um we had gotten word that there was a uh, a senior ranking naval officer um that wanted to talk to marcus and generally speaking uh we try to avoid having interrogative type questioning uh, going on while we're trying to perform this reintegration. Mm -hmm. It's not helpful. Um, and it puts the a survivor in a defensive posture. And um, a lot of times what we lose is fidelity because they, they shut down and they don't want to talk about mm -hmm. things. They become afraid. But we want the fullest expression of the story, right? So that we can get it all documented down mm -hmm. and we can learn from it so that others can learn. So um, we try to keep the two separate. And there's a time and a place for an investigation. And it's likely not right exactly now. Mm -hmm. We can wait a week or a, a day or something like that. And so we were, you know, that, that rumor um, that we had somebody coming in kind of put a little bit of pressure on us um, to make sure that we were staying true to Marcus and preserving, you know, his, one, one of the things that he wanted to do is participate in this ceremony and uh or ceremonies and uh they're all on that thing yeah and uh you know one has to consider the gravity of the circumstances the single largest loss of life in the history of the united states navy seals mm -hmm. just happened um and you know to come in and, and and ask for an explanation right away is maybe not the time maybe we need to take a little bit of time to grieve and maybe that's the best most charitable way of saying it now, I don't know, I, I never met any senior ranking naval officer that was on his way to come talk to Marcus, but I trusted it, the rumor was likely true. I never met anyone. Um, but uh, once Marcus, once we got through with the ramp ceremony, then it was time to get him out of country. We needed to get him to Germany. And, uh, you know, during the course of conversation, during the course of training, um, I had this mental map this mental image that um there was a an agency that was responsible for that um and i could give them a call and they would make certain arrangements happen and we could get marcus to germany this is when dell is with you too yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we pick a couple people key people to mm -hmm. go through the reintegration thing so we asked marcus hey who's your best bud he's like well you know there's this guy back and it wasn't like hey i'm digging at the bottom of the barrel trying to find that one-eyed fish mm -hmm. no it was Del. dell's name came up immediately how about that dude and uh, so we went and found Dell. We got him to pack his trash, and he's going to get on an airplane, come to Germany with us. And he was like, "What? What are you talking about? Like, I'm I'm ready to get in the fight. Like, what what's going on here?" And we're like, "I mean, no. he's part of the position. Everyone else was dead." Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he. I mean, I, you know, there wasn't much. Of us, there wasn't many, many of us left. Yeah. He got yeah, and he he never left your side. Yeah. Never no, left your side. They gave you gave him. A, he had a the hospital bed beside him. I felt so bad. Man, I was like, I'm positive, bro. I'm sorry you got that. Yeah, he was a trooper. <laughs> Well, I mean, Del, thank you. yeah, if you if, if you think about what you're called to do, um, most people think like if you're trained to be a SEAL, you're going to be pulling triggers. That's going to be your contribution. 
Um, not always. Mm -hmm. You're going to save lives too. And sometimes they may be your best friend. Mm -hmm. So I never uh, loved me. Yeah, man. And uh, so we, I, I ended up calling the back home to the Combined Air Operations Center and asking for a, you know, a, a C-17. And I got turned down. And uh, so nobody had any ear lift. And it was time to get Marcus out of town. He was, he was ready to go. Um, and he needed to get to some more significant medical care. Right? He was, he was, his health was declining. And this is a whole other level. Like This is a very deep concern to us. Because you can put him on antibiotics and you can try to you know, tend to his wounds and stuff like that. But he needs to get to bright lights and cold steel. Like, you know, um, and get to you know, more significant care. Not that the, they didn't care for him, but um, these kinds of injuries take time to heal. And this isn't, this is, these are traumatic injuries and they're likely a disease process, a medical issue going on simultaneously. And so really you need a staff of specialists. And you're talking specialists. about like the severe dysentery that yeah. was going on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was real sick, man. Yeah. Well, you know, and you did a couple things that didn't help, right? So swallowing all that cheap. <laughs> I mean, yeah, oh yeah, I do that. Yeah, I did that for sure, man. So um, I don't know if we can get into it, but um, you you did some interesting things while you were, uh, you know, um, held in captivity yes, um, to kind of help uh, establish a posture, right? Um, I recall one of them is of giving rip fuel uh, to your How about that? medicine. Can you believe that? <laughs> I had it in my. <laughs> And then the, hey, man. I'm a doctor. Look, I, I have know, pills. I hook take those these. kids up every day. They come back in. They're like, I feel great, man. Because like, yeah. I wouldn't take it because I had all these injuries. So I still had I had my morphine. We all, we a, all carried rip fuel in our pocket our because fuel. we never knew we were going to have a mission drop. That's right. That was the thing back then. That was then. the thing. And I mean, you know, ephedra. That's and I was a medic. Oh, yeah. yeah, the ephedra. That's what was in that sucker. <laughs> yeah. You know when you open the bottle, it's that orange. Yeah, kind yeah, of, man. It smells like, <laughs> remember it smells that? like victory. That's right. It smells like victory. I feel like I'm winning already. They put that um, opium putty in his mouth oh, when he was in. Oh, that was work on me, yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no, they no, actually no. put when. Um, go to oh, well, that, that's sorrow. Do that, yeah, that, that's just a different type of chew. It comes out yeah. of a little pack. You put Man. it in there. It's like a skull bandit. That's what I thought it was. It was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Laid me out. Yeah, I, I had a couple. Well, I, I, rumor is there's. Been I did it as a joke. I think yeah. A few guys that are like, hey, let me have some of that. You know, I'm out of I'm out of chew, and they put it in. Uh, take a nap for a little while for wake a while. up and like oh shit I better hope I hope I don't get a piss but test over those here. Afghans thought that was the funniest oh they did it was funny. A, they love that oh they love that those are some hard dudes man yeah for straight sure straight up straight up yeah. um, so uh, one of the other things that Marcus had done uh, to kind of create uh, this uh, idea that he was uh, sick right I think there was a at one point you kind of told him you were needed you were a diabetic, diabetic right? yeah. and I freaking so showed up with it the injury he, he ate a bunch of chew um, which made him sick and he was throwing up and everything and you know of course he's carrying on and whatnot and they're like oh, he is sick you know let's go and then what I happened kept trying to take, take him to the hospital that yeah. was my biggest thing i was like can you give me the hospital they tried to take me the car I remember they blew the car up and i was just i mean every time i tried to do something it would kind of there would always be this roadblock and then that was my and then they'd show up with these needles full of stuff i was like what is that <laughs> <laughs> you're like no like, he says i'm taking all these drugs and i was just like what the Are you feeling a little disconnected from the things you learned back in school? Wondering if it was even worth it? Well, I've got good news for you. And it's never too late to dive deeper and gain a more meaningful understanding of the world that we live in. Hillsdale College can provide you with that opportunity with subjects like history, economics, literature, and the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. They offer courses that dive into those topics that actually affect our daily lives. And even if you have learned these subjects before, a bit of a refresher never hurt anybody. Hillsdale College has been the beacon of education since 1844, committed to providing an education rooted in faith, freedom, and character. And here's the best part. They've made some of their core campus classes available for free online. Yeah, I said it, for free. And whether you want to explore the depths of the U.S. Constitution or study the works of C.S. Lewis and even unraveling the complexities of World War II. There's so many different subjects that you can dive into, and Hillsdale College is here to guide you through all of it. Over 3 million people have already taken this online course, and now it's your turn.
So go check out some of these 39 free courses to choose from. And they're also self-paced online courses that are easy to follow. You can start whenever, wherever you want with no long-term commitment required. So go right now to hillsdale.edu slash TNQ to enroll. There's no cost and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash TNQ to register. hillsdale.edu slash TNQ. Marcus was like, <laughs> at, at, at the time, he's like, you know, um, he's trying to get kind of get a feel for like, hey, man, did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? And uh, he's like, yo, man, I feel really bad because I'm pretty sure that shit got packed over the mountains. You know, insulin got packed over the mountains on a mule. So probably some people died <laughs> like getting that to me. And, and, and it, you know, like, can you tell me, is everybody OK? And I'm like, yeah, NSTR, like nothing significant to report here. Like, it, I'll but, never I mean, forget like, him. I was like, that's it was like. This is important stuff. I hope you know you don't need to because I didn't want to take it either. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, there's somebody needs that more than me. No, yeah. no, you're good. Yeah. Like, All right. Oh my gosh. So um they were great taking care of me. Yeah, part of the uh, the whole thing about building rapport was so fascinating. And I don't know if this translated it either, but um the prayer beads, the 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 cap and the gown, the man jammies, yeah. those were all gifts given to you um as you built rapport and trust. And these were not lightly given. Um, to be given the clothing from the village elder mm -hmm. is a personification of being him himself. Given the beads uh, is a a whole like it's it's a bona fides being passed. You know, like uh, as Catholics, uh, Catholics have prayer beads. Monks, uh, you know, uh, Hindus, whatever they have. We have various different in instruments. From their culture, um, this is a um, a trans translation, and I, I think that, I, and I don't know if this was talked about, but your adherence to your faith in captivity was unique among all stories I've ever heard. Um, your rediscovery of your faith and prayers uh, that you learned as a child um, while you were isolated further how about that it didn't come out till they isolated me i'd forgotten that i knew them yeah mm -hmm. and i mean like you were you were preparing for death yeah because oh yeah. yeah that's exactly what that was yeah and you thought okay this is it they're put me in the hole that i'm going to be i'm going to die in and so this was the point of self-reflection where you made you reconciled yeah i you wrote know? it on the wall carved yeah. it in there god will give me yeah, you carved a cross in the wall yeah. and you were like okay here are these childhood i i couldn't remember them up until this very moment, but these were gifts given to me. I've rediscovered in captivity. Freaking teenagers and the adolescents. That's how I built that. I started with the kids. Yeah, of course. And then I worked my way up throughout the day, and the adults would come in there. And by the time we we were laughing and giggling, and then they would they would come because you know how they pray. Yeah. Yep. They'd be like Mr. fervently. Murphy, yeah. Time to get time to. Go. I was like, okay. Now, one of the things you told me was, and uh, and I, I assume this to be true, but you said that um, you were very very clear that you were not going to pray to their gods you're going right. to pray to your gods yeah we but joke about it because I, I was praying with them yeah that was the whole I had that saint christopher around my neck because they would teach the first day i had that rifle leaning over there and the little kid walks up and he's teaching me their prayer one of the opening phrase of it i, I still I, I recognize it now right and then uh i was like okay so i'd start saying mine out loud, and i thought that they thought that was funny because I would start saying my prayer when they were just as like kind of a sing along. Yeah, I was doing whatever I could, man. I was just. I remember Gulab when he was visiting us through the translator saying to me that you, like, basically swore to Muslim to Islam while you were there. That was his translation, mm -hmm. I think. But there we're, were other that. people there. Yeah, yeah, we're good. But with I that. think that that was their translation that he was trying to do that, even though, in what I I think there's this huge misconception with, um, well, when I was talking to him through a translator, obviously, he did not believe that we believed in the First Testament. Hmm. So I think what they're told 
is that our Bible and everything, everything that we believe is just completely different than what they believe. Because I had asked him certain Bible stories that were in the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. Noah's Ark, you know, just different things, Adam and Eve, just different, very basic Bible stories. And his translator said, yes, they believe in these things. And I'm like, so do we. And that really threw him for a loop. So Yeah, there's a such thing as misinformation and yeah. there's disinformation. Right. Right. And so that's yeah, and kind they're of not the having thing. it. The Taliban right. has took it has taken advantage of, you know, their ability to create yeah. disinformation. And I I really think that um that one of the reasons they hate us so much as Christians is because they do believe that we're we're praying to our beliefs are just completely different than theirs. Although our there are some major differences, but the Old Testament's the same. Yep, so exactly. So <laughs> it's very interesting to compare those two. I am very interested in theology as a whole and mm-hmm. just how, just in different regions, like what what we believe in the similarities and, and the differences um, and comparing those. But um, when Gulab visited us back in, well, he visited us twice. The first time was right after we met um, and moved in with each other. That was a huge culture shock for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the second time being in 2013, the winter of 2013, early 2014. And uh, we had a lot of time to just talk about those kind of things. But he, I think, now that was his. There were several villagers there, um, but for his... Um, interpretation is that Marcus was being Muslim while he was up there. Well, and you know, and that's, um, that's I'm, thank you for surfacing that. And I think that um, from, a, this is a very delicate subject mm-hmm. for, for many Americans, right? So um, it's important that Americans understand that building rapport in captivity mm-hmm. is one of the, it's a, it's a, it's a duty, mm-hmm. um, and so if you if you pull the John Wayne Act, you're going to get tortured mm-hmm. and killed, yeah. likely. Um, but if you build rapport, <laughs> you want to walk in somebody's house and crap on the floor. Yeah, right. no, it's not a good. Way, there's an old city, right? <laughs> when in Rome, yeah, when in yeah. Rome, man. Well, I think there's just a general show of respect too. Like if I, when yeah. we went to Japan and we went to, we <clears> saw the temple in. Um, it, right there in Tokyo. When we walked up, we were very respectful. Do I believe in all of that? No, that's not mm-hmm. my belief, but we respected it. We respect the, the said like no women at some point where I couldn't cross through, so I didn't go. I mean, mm-hmm. you're very respectful. If I'm walking into a synagogue or wherever it is, we're always going to be respectful of other people's faiths. Um, just like if a Baptist comes to a Catholic church, they're not going to chew gum and, you know, whatever in... Well, if you walk in there with your, your the, how you study, like whatever your philosophy is and how you practice it, like your stuff doesn't stink and you're going in there. Yeah. That's not, first That's of not all, turn out well it doesn't even say to do that. Mm-hmm. It tells you to do the opposite of that. Right, to respect yeah. and love. I mean, so. it says that in the beginning. Well, um, so if you're going to love your neighbor like you love yourself, if you're in your neighbor's house, man, you better think mm-hmm. about that. So, but even though Marcus was not praying or like to God, to, oh, no, I'm saying to, I mean, that's what they're getting on me. They're Allah? just saying it a different way. That's what that word means, right? Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, like we could probably um, have a whole other discussion on mm-hmm. the faith aspect of things. Um, I've never even thought about what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, there's some would say it's the same God. Others would say there's no way it's the same God. Right. Um, so it's, um, it's sensitive, right? Yeah. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, you know, to learn a little bit about Muslim history. Um, it's, it's important that we all do. Mm-hmm. Um, there are many, many conflicts um, predating all of this, I'd say that um, I wouldn't characterize. Do you know what year Islam came online? Uh, I want to say it was like, uh, is it eight hundred or six twenty eight? Six twenty eight. Okay, June twenty eight. So yeah, that's how I remember it. Th- there's uh, my understanding, and uh, you know, like, of course, this has, you know, of course, I'm seeing it through the lens of my military education, right? Um, is there, you know, like. 
there may be some very inconvenient truths out there um, compared to what modern mu Islam is, oh, compared sure. to where they started with Muhammad and his entourage. Well, people change. Yeah. Grow, I mean, times well, change, and that, that's how that... We, we'd like to think that, um, you know, like well, Protestantism is a good, uh, you know, segue for that. Like we have a whole schism in our church yeah. that is ended up being something else, um, and which has happened in Islam mm -hmm. right from the beginning. Uh, you know, you have the heir, the, 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 the son of Muhammad, who ended up with a whole other, you know, sect. And you got those that inherited the church, essentially, that he created a book. Um, and that they became another one. And then they, they've been fighting ever since because they tried to assassinate one it's another. It's like two brothers. But I think the real rub here is that wh why was Muhammad in the desert in the first place? And why was he uh, uh, hiding out is because he was betrayed, mm -hmm. right, by the Jews, right? And so uh, my understanding is, is that the Islamics initially prayed toward Jerusalem. Mm. I don't know if you know that. I don't. So after the betrayal in the desert, they changed their orientation uh, to the birthplace of Muhammad, is my understanding. Hmm. Um, so it, it's an interesting, there is a lot of history there. Um, and it is certainly like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a historian. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, my, I'm probably wrong about everything I just said. So, <laughs> I, you know, um, but I, 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 I try to not, not to wade into those um, arguments oh, yeah, or discussions because yeah. I'm just talking about them and they're trying to make a point and, and b uh, browbeating somebody. Yeah, about no. That's, that's, I just, and no, we got off the subject, but I was just, it interested me when you said that because, mm -hmm. yes, building rapport in any and every way is super important. And what Marcus did, what he was able to gain not only trust, but almost respect with the village. I still have it. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's and I'm, I am who I am, I, mean, and I yeah. still have it. So, Mel, I mean, there's some things here, I mean, maybe we can throw out on the table, um, that are incredibly unique mm -hmm. to this um, this event. Marcus is a painted man. I mean, when you come down to, like, Muslims and tattoos that's and a such. That's a big deal, too. That's a big deal, <laughs> right? I'd almost got my ass thrown out. Yeah, I, I mean, there are so many taboo subjects that we teach. You absolutely never, ever discuss. He did. He rewrote, single-handedly rewrote a lot of our resistance posture mm. um, training because we were fighting a different kind of enemy that we didn't write manuals for. The manuals that we had that he you know, would have received training in uh, or had his peers receive training in and he you know, got by osmosis, um, those were all written for a formal combatant. So a near peer engagement, like you would have, you know, the Axis versus the Allies, you know, the North Koreans versus uh, South Koreans, mm -hmm. North Vietnamese versus South. This was a very different kind of war. This counterinsurgency operation, um, we didn't have a, a playbook. Um, and furthermore, um, hostage is was not something that we had a really strong playbook for, and we certainly. Of that, those that were educated with the playbook we had, those were very highly specialized individuals, um, and that was that that was some very secretive type of of training. Now, today, every single airman is trained on hostage. It's a very different set of rules. Mm -hmm. um, if you are in peacetime governmental, like you you're held by a a, a foreign country. Mm -hmm. and they are not openly declared war against uh, America, that's a different um, way to act and behave. You don't, you know, it's sort of like this. Um, if I'm in, held in captivity um, and I kill the guard, right, would I go to jail? Yeah, mm -hmm. you would. You should wait till your government negotiates your release, right? right. So this is not wartime. Mm -hmm. And so Marcus had to extrapolate you know, with what he had, he had to work through it. And mm -hmm. one of the things that he did um, was he didn't pull the John Wayne, mm -hmm. which is human nature, especially for men our age. Mm -hmm. You grow up watching Dirty Harry Callahan and, you know. That's all I watched. Well, yeah, yeah, me too. My <laughs> dad does painted up like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you've got Charles Bronson out there, um, S Stallone, uh, you know. And, Schwartz. Schwarzenegger. All of them, man. That's, that's Everyone, it's all the male role models, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this toxic masculinity out there that says, hey, you know, you need to uh, buck up, you know, and, and, and be John Wayne, you know, and, yeah. you know, 
And then all of a sudden, Marcus finds himself in this thing, and he's like, yeah, um, these guys are going to, I'm going to make these guys my friends. And well, I'm going to. They were John Wayne's. I got put in a room full of freaking John Wayne's. So well, I there you go. <laughs> I mean, so then, so then like what, what, to what benefit yeah. is it that you're going to challenge them in their own village as the alpha male? Right. That's not what you're called to do. You're called to survive. Right. I couldn't walk or anything. I was been running my mouth. Yeah. Then I'd have just been some punk. Yeah. Because you don't have to speak the language to be a punk. Everyone knows what that looks like, the aggression well, levels well, and all and that. Well, anyone who's around Marcus knows he is the alpha male. Yeah, I'm a, so I can be. Yeah, I can be a punk be, too, man. I, yeah. I can run my mouth if yeah. I need to. Did you Did you ever tell the story of your attempted escape? No. Uh, no, okay. That didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much stuff that I did. And they'd bust me and I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, I had to kid, kid zone it sometime. I'm, I'm like, you know, they got would get mad and they would smack me. Especially when I would know when I'd live and they'd teach me something and I'd reach out for something and then they'd be like, because right. they started to like me. I mean, we got a, yeah. a relationship. But I knew that first, when the women would show their face to me. Oh, uh, wow. At the oh. end. That's how I knew. Yeah. Because they would start to feed me and then they would check on me and that's a big, and I, yeah, that whole doctor. I always show to them. I think that got me a, a long way too. I was always yes sir. Oh, I'd try to stand up when the elder would come in. I knew who he was, so I'd always make a big point to try to get up. And he saw he would be like, you know, he'd, he'd kind of do that. Never they do. And then they would laugh at me because I would fall down sometimes. And then eventually they saw what I was trying to do. I just kept trying. Mm -hmm. I would fail all the time. I can't believe they kept me. They should. I mean, I even. I think I laughed about. I was like, man, y'all need to get rid of my ass, dude. Because I. I mean, I ain't mean <laughs> nothing. But then when that J Dam came down, I was like, I'm sorry, man. I don't. I didn't know. Yeah, you wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I didn't know about a lot of that stuff. Well, so he, they would ask me, and sometimes I'd snicker. They were like, hey, man, we the boys whipped our ass. Like, yeah, they do that. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, he tends to be a bull in a china cabinet. I am. Too, I so I can't imagine all the things he broke. <laughs> well, you know, and that, that, that's a, there's an endearing aspect to that, right? Because, you know, you're in their house and they're like, oh, you know, dirty American. And they're, they're stereotyping, you know, just as badly as we tend to do. Um, and so Marcus comes in and he dispels a lot of that, um, you know, with humility. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot to be said about, about about being humble because guess what? People are more receptive to your language. Mm -hmm. um, we're well, finding out you. that you're you can be more lethal that way too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why women make great you know they're the best. Too. At, so good. That's a great point. I try mm -hmm. and make it. What you just said is an absolute fact. That's why they're so damn lethal. Yeah, that's a gift, a, a tool, whatever you want to call it, man. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, and there, there's some lessons learned there um, that, you know, have been applied. And uh, I think we're seeing a lot more uh, women in, in these pivotal roles. Um, you know, of course, we've learned a lot of lessons in the Air Force. We have some incredible um, aviators um, and other women leaders. Um, we've had uh, Mick Sally, um, who. Uh, the problem is that they just want to see them in public. They want to know that they're there. We we have them. There's yeah. Our most badass operators are women. We just keep them top secret. I we got don't, a chance we don't... to work with one uh, who was, I think, one of the first that went through the OTC at Delta. Yeah, I mean, we got them. And uh, my word, she's a uh, in you know, like we talk about wasps early in the conversation. That's another trailblazer. Right yeah, there. they kind of. That's exactly what that is. Yeah, I mean, just like ours roll, like something new comes online and then it gets it gets used and it goes to something that we they do that too. Yeah. So did Sear School change after Marcus? Yeah. Came back so him? after we got done, I wrote um, after we got done in, in Germany. Uh, I should probably mention uh, part of the the reintegration. I ended up we were we were kind of we were without an airplane, so. Um, we were all in the bus down by the airfield because it was time to go. And I had no, no plan. <laughs> my plan, uh, my plan was not working. So I stopped by, we, we parked out in the parking lot for the airfield building, right? And they had a security gate and all that stuff. And I went in and there was a whole bunch of people waiting to leave Afghanistan. It's like a long line of people always waiting to leave. So we're looking for any kind of space whatsoever because their orders are expired. It's time for them to go, you know, that. And so they, sometimes they wait there for weeks trying to get out. Yeah. So, and we've got, you know, we've got Marcus and uh, two, serious, two serious psychologists, myself, Marcus and Dell. And Dell. Right? So, um, 
I go in there and I'm like, hey, I'm this guy, you know, I'm kind of special and I need a favor. And they're like, piss <laughs> off. And I'm like, no, I don't think you get it. I'm this guy, I'm special and I need a favor. And they're like, no, I don't think you get it. Piss off. And I was like, okay, do you have a room? And they're like, well, what's a room going to do? I'm going to give you the same answer. I'm like, hmm, let's go into another room. I opened up a briefcase, pulled out a non-disclosure, and I said, sign that. And they're like, uh, I've never, I, what, what is this? And I'm like, just sign it. It's a non-disclosure. You're not going to be able to tell anybody what you just, what I'm telling you right now. So they sign it. I put it back in the briefcase and I'm like, okay, I'm special. <laughs> I need an airplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And they're like, oh, okay. Uh, well, I'll let you out on the airfield. There's no, there's no airplanes, but you can go out on the airfield. Like, okay, thank you. So I get on the airplane or we get in the, I get in the, the little jingle bus. We drive out to the airfield and we're parking there and I'm watching the C-17 get loaded up and uh, all these people are getting in the belly of the airplane. And I look over and there's a guy standing off the wing. And I'm like, I'll be right back. So I jump out. I go over to the guy and I'm like, hey, you the pilot? He's like, yes, I am. I'm like, hi, my name is Jay. Uh, I'm in the Air Force and uh, I need a favor from another airman. And he's like, what kind of favor you need? And I'm like, mm, I have precious cargo that I need to get to Germany, which is where you're going. And uh, I need you to take myself and the guys in that van over there and uh, get us over there. And uh, I, I can't tell you who we are. <laughs> uh, the rest of us, yeah, I can tell you. But the guy that I'm asking, like, w w I have somebody that I need to transfer. And he's like, well, who is this guy? I'm like, he's an American. And he goes, oh, yeah, no problem. Nah. <laughs> so um, they put Marcus on the flight deck in the in their bunk. Well, this is when it got cool. Is when we started moving me like this, because I didn't have my name, ID, all that had been erased. And then there was a film crew on the bird. That's the reason there was a big problem getting me on there. Well, HBO, right? No, no, no. So, so they, there was a 60 minutes film crew that had been in country and they had been done they had done filming they're doing an expose and when marcus's event happened they like did everything to stay in country they're like we've got to get the story and everything and you you weren't aware of it at the time i don't think we told you until after we got there but doc the two docs all, like we sat in the aircraft intermixed with those what, film crew. On the wall. I, yeah. I remember hearing that. You remember telling me that. Yeah. And I come up. Because y'all stuck me up in the pilot's cockpit, yeah. up in the bedding. Up oh, stuff. he he came. So we, we we came in the back there. So they were looking for Marcus. And they were like, it could be him. It could be him, right? So we had Marcus come in the crew door while the rest of them were loading up. And I was yeah, like literally right. waiting for the exact yeah, right yeah, timing to go, right. go now, Just go now, get there. him in. That's right. So he gets up and he goes in there and he gets into, you know, it's a bunk. So there's like. It's the know, best. Yeah. So he racks out, right? It was the best. They juiced and, me up. That's chocolate chip cookies, man, he made. I'll never forget that. <laughs> it's Air Force. Come on now. It was so good. <laughs> it, yeah, great. He kind of set me I'm up. I'm surprised you didn't hit the milkshake Not machine. Hello, pillow, dude. Yeah. <laughs> You've got It was cream. great. <laughs> I remember looking down and, at, at the pilot, and he was sleeping, sitting up again. Because no, that's a big deal. I mean, yeah. you, you want your pilots to have rest. And he's like, bro. Yeah. He was real cool to me. I, yeah. mean, I don't even remember who he was. I don't, no, I don't either. He was a uh, he was a captain at the time, yeah. And uh, great dudes, yeah. And so I'd go up and check on him. Is he still asleep? Yeah, he's still asleep. Okay, cool. And so we rode in that thing, and uh, you know, we're course. It's so live. I mean, there's still stuff going on. We're trying to still maintain communication. To find if they got hacks. So we're going back. I'm contacting. You know, hey, and I'm talking also to the. That, that's right, because the mission's still going. The mission's Red still Wing going. is still going after yeah, I'm yeah. rescued in the hospital. There's still people on the ground. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It. They're trying to. The find recovery out. goes for weeks. Yeah, the recovery right. effort is still going on. Right. So I'm coordinating with them. You're asking. You, one of the things that you're asked. I mean, very first question you asked is, "Where's my brother? Is he okay?" Yeah. Right. I'll never yeah. forget that. That's right. How'd he call him? Yeah. And then uh, you know the next question is, "Where are my teammates? Right? Are they okay? Like, did mm -hmm. you get them?" And uh, so this is really, really tough because, like, how do you parse that out in a way that's digestible but factual? Mm -hmm. You can't, like, sugarcoat something to a seal. He's just going to spit it out. Mm -hmm. It needs to have, like, fully salted. But it needs to be chewy, too. Like, it's mm -hmm. got to be a licky chewy there. And it just sucks delivering bad news. So, you know, like, he didn't get bad news until much later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you know, of course, the, I think I might have been the one to deliver it. 
if I'm not mistaken, I might have would have been the one that told you that your your teammates were mm. were gone. And um, so uh, we were in flight in Germany. You know, going to yeah. Because remember, to in the first debrief, you said you were still looking for him. Yeah. For for X. Yeah. Yep. So um, you know, the, the, you know, it's sort of like how do you how do you? And I was like, we haven't given up hope, but it doesn't look good. We're still looking for him. You know, the, kind of that. Um, you, you know, and so I'm communicating with the guys back in Germany uh, over the aircraft, and because uh, you know, uh, I have a seer specialist waiting that waiting to to, uh, to receive us. Mm -hmm. Now the whole team that's there in Germany is gone. Mm -hmm. They're off on a boondoggle. They're doing free fall jumps in like uh, I think uh, Holland or uh, someplace like that, Belgium. And so we got this one guy who was on his way to the Tour de France. To watch that's the right. That was going on. I forgot yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. So right. you got, you got, you know, and he's like, I got my whole, I got tickets. My whole family's packed in the car. Like, what do you mean? I got it. Like, and they're like, I remember and, hearing that. The so he gets a tour de France. They're not even here. Yeah. And he, and he, and he was like, I, I talked to him this morning. I called him. It's the first time I've talked to him. In, I don't know, maybe ten years or so. And, uh, and you know, he was like, Wait a minute. Tell me again what's going on. And there's some lieutenant colonel on the line. He's like, Yeah, you know the this is a reintegration thing. I don't know. It's just I don't know. The guys are calling. They're saying something. It doesn't sound like a big deal. I mean, maybe you could still go, whatever. And he's like, Yeah, there's no such thing as a re reintegration coming to launch tool. That's not big. Like, uh, no, I I got it. Thanks. Appreciate it, dummy. You know. And uh, so, um, <clears throat> before. We we left. Um, I had contacted our, our my communique, and I told him I was like, "Hey, listen, I have this thing going on. There's this checklist, right? I'm gonna take like imagine it's a tree of all these people I'm, you're gonna c contact. And this is like it was a media frenzy, a circus for Jessica Lynch and the 507. There were people. The international press was like trying to beat the gates down. There were people everywhere trying to take pictures and all that stuff. It was. Like she like showed up on a balcony waving and like it was it was uh, it was crazy. I remember that I stayed in her room. Mm -hmm. That doc said like oh, got you yeah. in the pediatric ward. That's where they hid me. Right. And he's like that's the balcony where she did all the. That's where so, I woke up. So the guys that actually uh, did that reintegration while she was there, they wrote a bunch of reports and those reports were just like four eyes only, like internally, like hey, if we ever do this, let's not do this or let's do that. I was one of the first people to read that because I was involved in it. Yeah. And so I helped draft a lot of it because I'd ask the questions because having been a part of it, you know, it's always good to have that third party, right? To say like, hey, well, when you did this, did you do this? What was the other thing? Blah, blah, blah. And like, oh, that's right. And so that's why it's always good to have somebody on the outside. So with Marcus coming in, um, we were sitting out by in, in the thing and we were getting ready to get on the airplane. And that's when I turned around and I said, Marcus, do you know who I am? And he goes, you're the fucking man. <laughs> I said, no, Marcus, you're the man. Aww. Okay, so let's be clear. I said, I have a question to ask you, and I'm not gonna, I want you to think about this. Do you want to continue to operate, or do you want to be a hero? I'll never forget that. Mm. And he thinks about it, and he goes, fuck, man, I want to operate. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And that was the fork in the road that we needed. And so at that point, what I did is I just started lopping off limbs of our checklist. And I was like, I don't need dip, 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 dip. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna shrink this thing way, way down. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna we're gonna hold, 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 and then we're gonna release. And the way it worked out is we went through the all the debriefing, the tactical debriefing. Yeah. We went through all the medical stuff and everything else. And guess what? On the other side of it, we ended up going to the BX. And he could walk and amongst every no one had any idea who he was and yeah. we got him clothing we got him good chow you know and he was able to like decompress outside of the hospital and when we had people like you know trying to kind of figure out a way to get in you know like just to peep on him you know mm -hmm. and so that was pretty easy we had security um set up on both ends but inevitably there would always be somebody that was kind of you know, oh you know i'm here to do house you know but my signature nope. was so low that when we would move, you the press wouldn't look over that way. Yeah. With the We'd story, always have like a distraction. Yeah, there was always something going on to, to where I could move autonomously. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was it was it was great. And uh what it, what that translated to was a natural decompression where he had his friend by his side and it was like 
the doors open to the jail and it's no longer a jail. Mm -hmm. It's a hospital and it's I'm here for care and I'm just another patient. And like he had an entire wing, you know, which is all completely locked down. And so, you you know, like and we have guys that are injured that are coming in out of theater, you know, mm -hmm. with significant injuries. Um, and so they're in another wing and, uh, and, it, and it worked out great. Um, eventually, it worked out so well that we were able to go downtown. And uh, we went to a Thai restaurant. Mm. How long were y'all in Germany for? I want to say it was, it was wasn't it wasn't quite two weeks. Was almost two weeks is what I was. Yeah, thinking. I think in like maybe ten days or something, something like that. Mm -hmm. I I had all the dates and all the you know stuff logged, but I I lost it and started losing the track in a crash, a uh, hard drive crash. But it was there at the Thai restaurant that uh, we all got together and we had a beer. And this is the glass that I had. Um, you had one just like it, and I don't know, you've probably Dr. lost Dickens. yours by now. It's somewhere in the vault. Somewhere yeah. in the vault. But this I've kept uh, with me. Uh, it's gone all over the world with me. Wow. And uh, so I, was, I, I gave up drinking a couple of years ago, but um, I gave up drinking for, you know, other reasons, uh, not health-wise. And so I'm ready to have a drink <laughs> whenever you are. But, he gave um, up drinking I a couple too, years man. ago, too. Yeah. So maybe y'all can have did, some bro. sweet tea. I'll make you some sweet tea. All righty. <laughs> yeah, we'll drink some of that. Um, after, after we went and had uh, dinner um, that night, we had a couple photos taken. And uh, those may be the only photos that we have ever had together. And that might be the only photos that we had with Doc Dickens as well. Della Penta has them, and I, I don't know where he is. I'd love to have him. And I, I, uh, I maybe did my best to browbeat him and say, listen, if I don't get these, I'm going to find you. I'm going to kill you. Uh, and I probably didn't follow through on that. But uh, <laughs> He's hard to kill. We'll find him, though. I know yeah. it's out there, though. I, yeah. Especially that one of, when we're at the, at the Porsche dealership. Now, I've got, the one, I've got the one at the Porsche dealership. That's, uh, it's, that's a whole other story. So, Marcus, uh, one of the other things, you know, I mentioned this about him uh, not wanting to quit. So there's always another follow-on mission. So Marcus, in you know, going through all of this, it's kind of coming, it's, it's, he's reconciling with everything. And he's like, man, you know what I, I could really do? I could really do with some team time. I need my boys around me. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be back in the environment. And so we drove him to Stuttgart. Uh, and I think it was team two that was in town yeah, at the thing. time. And uh, so we went to the, we went to the team and uh, I think Doc and I pitched in, we bought a bunch of pizzas. And uh, so you came in and we had pizzas with the team and they had absolutely no idea who Marcus was. And, and I'll be damned, uh, neither Doc nor I was going to tell him either. Um, the idea was to make it as, as organic as possible. And of course, uh, did they give him the stink eye? Yes, they did. It was a bunch of young whippersnippers in there that were like, fashion. yeah, yeah. They looked at him like, who are you? Mm -hmm. You know, you, are you even a seal? Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was it was it was crazy. Uh, at least that's how I remember it. Um, and it was Marcus thing. was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, while he was there, they he, he ended up befriending him. Uh, and and it, I don't know if he ever told him. Mm. Never. Well, while we were there, um, we we needed some we needed some airfare and we needed somebody to run interference uh, because as we understood it, uh, this kind of like this road show was getting tracked down and there were people that were wanting to have some answers. And so their commander, uh, we, Doc Dickens and I talked to their commander, we impressed upon him rather seriously that he needed to interject himself um, and interrupt what was uh, transpiring. And, you know, he, he dug in and said no. And uh, I did my best. And then Doc Dickens gave him the old, uh, as best as he could, as an 06. You know, hey, look, if there was ever a time in your life that you were going to do something right, this is now. Pick up the damn phone. Mm. And he, he decided not to. Um, I, I don't know uh, the inner workings of the Navy, but my understanding is, is that it's 200 years of tradition unhindered by progress. So, <laughs> so what were you trying to get him to do? Well, that's a whole other story, and I, I probably... Uh, it would be for maybe another time. Yeah. Uh, but the the idea is to um, you know protect Marcus um, mm -hmm. and and the legacy uh, and likely get him home uh, and get his family taken care of. Mm -hmm. So in the mid middle of all of this, we haven't really talked about your family being back here, your brother, um, and the toll that it's taken on them. Mm -hmm. 
that's a totally different story too. Yeah. It really is. Um, and so part of the reintegration, as I mentioned earlier, is like, hey, reintegrating to the unit, which we talked about, reintegrating with your family. And most people don't know that the Navy, um, I tried like the Dickens to get a joint agency in to see your family and debrief them on exactly what's about to happen. But they didn't have, it was 4th of July weekend, uh, and they didn't have a field team, so to speak. So my understanding is the Navy took care of it themselves. Yeah, send and the boys up. They sent some guys to your parents' house, yeah. um, and they did their best to brief, debrief them on what was happening as best they could. And uh, I don't know how much of the information that I was getting, that I was transmitting, was getting back to them. Mm -hmm. um, I, it wasn't something that I was keeping track of, but we generally do. Um, so the idea would be that, you know, um, Marcus had complete, uh, if I recall, there was a period of time where we were like, we didn't encourage you to call. Yeah. Um, because we were getting your story down and recording everything and all that. And it was a really trying. I got that too. I was like, Roger, I remember. Yeah. When you recall the story, and we, we dove into some really finite detail, mm -hmm. which is well above and beyond what we did in Afghanistan. Um that can trigger a whole lot of m a flood of memories and emotions. And I was deeply concerned about this process until Doc, uh, I had my own issues. And so I, I'm talking to Doc Dickens about it um, from a previous deployment. And he said, he told me about uh, a story, kind of a, a story about our rucksack. And he said, Jay, what's the first thing you do when you come off a mission? Well, like I dump my ruck. He goes, yeah. What do you do after that? I'm like, I reconstitute it. And he goes, are you doing that? And I was like, no. I so the say, say stuff like that is so so logical. You're like, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's why you're what are like you, some kind of doctor. Or yeah, something? yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> but I mean, guy. all the all the psychological baggage that we pack, and this this is what I tried to explain. Uh, I explained to Janine after when we met is that like you we are trained to compartmentalize mm -hmm. everything. And so every every deployment, every adverse adversity we face, we, we compartmentalize, and then we move to the next phase, the next chapter, whatever. It's like, it's a win, it's a loss, whatever, it's, it's tallied, mm -hmm. right? And we just keep moving. And Doc was like, no, uh, th that's actually good for training, bad for longevity. <laughs> mm. So longevity, you need to take it and dump it out empty it out completely, then put the stuff that you need back in there. Mm -hmm. The stuff that you don't need, you need to throw that away, mm -hmm. right? That's worthless wrappers and stuff like that that, yeah. that creates a parasitic drag on you and it becomes exponential over the course of a career. Right. And I think that's where um, we have a big gap between operators who, are, who have resilient, you know, and, and those that don't because they don't receive that. You know, where are you going to get that? Are you going to get that from, uh, a, you know, a civilian psychologist? Likely not. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. there's a lot that's been learned and it's been shared within their community. Well, but that's, I remember Doc talking to me. You could tell the book was out the door, right? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we were so... from a big brother kind of perspective. Uh, yeah. You're so good looking, too, you know? Like, oh, I told you. <laughs> you know, which, I told dude, you. Which Doc? Doc Dickens. Dickens. He's like, real good looking, too. So he's like, <laughs> okay, okay. So let's, let's tell the audience. Let's fill him in, right? He's a big so, guy, too. Oh, so he just kind of looks at me like. <laughs> so did you ever see the series The Unit I on have TV? not. No. Okay. So The Unit is about uh, Delta a, Force. Delta, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there is a guy that's in the series. He's an actor, and he plays a psychologist. He's a black man. Okay? He... Doc, the real person is more jacked and way more handsome. Like he's yeah, they couldn't find an actor to play. No, movie. they couldn't. No, uh, <laughs> like. He, he, so Dude, where the, is he now? He's oh, he's outside uh, of DC, right? I think, I think so. so still. He's probably in yeah, private we practice. Need to, yeah, we need to find him now. He's the funniest yeah. guy, man. He just, oh, he's he's incredible, and uh, he has. He, I don't know how many right, lives he's calling. Saved. Doc Dickens. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 his breath can... always smells like Nyquil. He's got a great smile. He's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he's got that. He's that guy. Yeah, it's, he's a guy it. that's Everybody's so handsome, PJs hate on him. Oh yeah. my gosh. Everybody <laughs> who got assigned to me has the most unique personalities and background, man. I mean, all of them. Every so, single one of them. From him on down, man. So we, we go visit the SEAL team, and then we're uh, we're finishing up. And uh, 
you know, I'm like, hey, uh, Marcus, is there anything anywhere else you want to go? And he's like, no, man, no, I'm good, man. He's like, you know what? What do you guys want to do? Shit, you guys have done everything for me. What do, what do you want to do? What do you want to do, Jay? We're, you know, and I was like, oh, no, come on, please. And he's like, no, no, seriously, seriously. I would be curious. What would you want to do? And I'm like, well, I mean, since you was asking, I have this thing about Porsches. I've, you know, owned a whole bunch of them. I got a couple of them parked in the garage. I would, I would love to go. I mean, we're here in Stuttgart. Let's go to the Porsche factory, go to the showroom floor and, and see what that's like. So he's like, shit, let's do it. So we jumped in the van. We cruised over there. It was right, right around the corner. Right around the corner. And uh, we, we jumped out and man, we went through that place and it was, uh, it was like going to a race car museum. Yeah. It was so amazing. Uh, and I was like, in, I was on cloud nine. I'm here with Marcus and uh, I'm here with my, my pet passion or whatever at the time. And um, I snapped a photo of him. I, I, I broke my own protocol in the sense of like, you know, you don't, as you know, when you're running an op like this, you don't, you don't do that. But I felt like if I didn't capture at least one image, um, I, I was, I was, so I captured, I think I have two. I have, and I, I found one recently, but the other one I've got to dig for. I have one with you and Doc and the Intel guy. Yeah. And Dell didn't come with us for this trip. Uh -huh. I think he went, I don't know if he went back to Afghanistan. Yeah, because Clint came in. Okay. And uh, Burke came in. We're leaving him. Yeah. And then, uh, so I, I took that photo. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we went back. And then you eventually made it to, uh, you got on an aircraft. I was knowing that, that whole so, trying to get home was difficult. That's yeah, we, story. <laughs> we got an aircraft for you. Um, and uh, let's tell a little, couple little bits left on the story. So, um, we're leaving. I'm getting. I'm putting you in the van. You're about to go to the airport to get to the uh, to get on the aircraft, and uh, we're walking through the parking lot. And I asked you. I said, Marcus, do you know what PJs do when we bury one of our friends? And you're like, No. And I said, Do you guys have any traditions in the seals? And you're like, I don't know. I don't think so. And I told him the story about how PJs put their flash yeah, in the top the flash. of the coffin. Yeah. And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out my flash. And he looks at me and he's like, God damn it. He reached in his pocket and he pulled out his trident. Mm. And we exchanged right there. And I said, Marcus, I don't know when and I don't know where, but you'll know the time when to put my flash on which coffin because uh, you're going to get an opportunity and teach. Teach everybody what you know, what you've learned. And uh, so that was, to me, one of the, it, there was one other artifact that you gave me. And you gave me your dad's Frogman pin. I still have it. And I mm. wore it inside of my beret for the rest of my career. It's wow. hanging on my wall at home. You can have it back if you want. <laughs> but you might have to come to come to Arizona to get no, we came it. No, we went, to get, we went down the Audubon, too. Oh, yes, we did. Remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. And I remember that being a cool thing, too. Yeah, man. <laughs> And then getting home because I got stranded in San Antonio. But a senator picked me up and threw me on his private plane. I had that a, was in D.C. or Virginia or Maryland, one of the two. And then we went from there to there. That's right. Space. That's right. That's right. So I because I didn't have my name or ID. And then who y'all passed me off to didn't. Here's the cool part. And this is why this was the most clandestine operation ever executed is because there was no formal anything before we made a movement. We showed up, asked for permission or please, or we just did it. And then, then they wrote it up. We were ahead of the write-ups, which was, which was made, it, gave us trouble, but that's why we were so fast. And uh, yeah, so slow is smooth and smooth, smooth is fast. fast. That's right. And that's the whole thing that that's, that's exactly how we operated. We didn't, we didn't bother. We learned early on that asking permission wasn't going to work. <laughs> we just and show up and go. So I employed uh, the very first thing I ever learned from SEALs, right? That's beg for forgiveness. Yeah. It, <laughs> if you ask for I'm permission, you already know. <laughs> I'm very great at that. Matter of fact, it, yes, when you show up, you're like, hey, I'm pretty sure that they might forgive me for this, so uh, I'm going yeah. to go and do it. All right. 100%. That, that, that's a real thing for me. Yeah. That's for us. Yeah, that's a real thing. 
<laughs> so, Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. I'm gonna give We're the only ones that can do that. that. <laughs> but, um, please forgive me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to hate me, but I've already Yeah, you're going to hate me for a while I'm doing it, but man, please. There's a reason. Yeah. Uh, but that was amazing. And to hear, um, you know, and, and see, there was a couple of times I've seen you, you know, throughout the years, popping up on the radar and, and, and uh, you know, giving back, you know, in different ways. And it was... Uh, Really, uh, an eye opener for me um, to hear that you started the never the uh, Exos Eagle Fund. Yes, the Eagle yes, Fund. So, for those uh, that are in the audience, I actually ended up going through the Eagle Fund, and many, many PJs have, mm -hmm. and controllers too, because it's close to Hurlbert, right? So we can be based, we can go TDY from Hurlbert to there. Mm -hmm. and the Air Force will let us do that. So I feel like. Um, and I've met others. I met um, Delta guys. I've met other SEALs. We can all go there. It's yeah. like a joint, it's a tactical thing. Yeah. It's, uh, it, for those of you who, who don't Save know lives. about this thing, like it is a worthy. We keep it hidden too. Yeah. How about that? It's definitely a little. We don't keep it hidden, but I don't advertise it. Yeah. I wouldn't have known it if I hadn't walked through your garage and seen the check. Yeah, buddy's got to, yeah. uh, you got to hear about it through the boys or the girls. Yeah. One of the two. Yeah, Somebody has been this word of mouth. Not talked about a whole lot, but Eagle Fund has put so many people back together mm -hmm. um, you saved my life yeah yeah me too it's yeah. i mean because i got sent there just yeah, like with everything too. else and then when it works for me i'm like well my boys love this and then his brother when his brother was in a helicopter in that helicopter crash, crash i was there getting fixed up when he my brother got in a helicopter, helicopter crash. crash so i had to go to virginia to get him and then we went together in 2008 and broke his um his back. pockets Coxies. He's Coxies. all busted. Up. I can never say that yeah. word. He's freaking, he's all busted. You <laughs> should just go for it. It's yeah. a classic. <laughs> yeah, and he, uh, he went to Eagle Fund to get fixed up. Mm -hmm. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. So you got some back rubs and milkshakes over yeah. there. <laughs> the best. Woo. Man, yeah. I think I pretty much told Helga all my stories. It's well, a, thank I, you for sharing yeah. everything. And I, per, as Marcus's wife, I love hearing everyone's perspective of what happened on their end from i mean red wing is a tragedy it really is it's there's no other way to say it it was a it was an a incredible tragedy because a lot of incredible things happened um from that there were a lot of um you know even the relationships that we have with the families like there are bonds that were created Still with them. after that like they're we were with Hell, that might have been the hardest thing I ever had to do. Yeah, but but from that tragedy, some incredible things have happened. And just hearing everybody's stories, to me, it just puts the puzzle all together. And I love hearing that. And thank you for sharing it because it's not easy to. That was a traumatic time for everybody mm -hmm. involved. So, thank you. You betcha. Um, if I could add a couple things, one is. I forgot to mention about the reintegration process where it was born. So the discovery of it was actually the Falkland Wars. Mm. So um, the British Empire at the time, and this is like in the what the 90s or something like that, 80s. They didn't have the resources to fly all their people home, so they put them in boats, yes. and they and they actually ferried them back, and they ended up stopping in like Spain or something like that, and ended mm -hmm. up getting back from Argentina. And the incidence rate of post-traumatic stress was almost zero mm. for a protracted campaign. And what we found was is that those the, the time to distance, the ability for the survivors, those that the the combatants to decompress with one another, was a direct it was a contributing factor. Mm. So oh, sure, I get that. That's interesting. Yeah. If you ever see the movie, I, I don't I don't espouse this, but the the movie The Hurt Locker, mm -hmm. there's one scene in it. That resonates with me, and that's when he comes home and he's standing in the supermarket. On the supermarket, dude. I told we you. all been there. Yeah, man. <laughs> the supermarket scene. Yeah. Whoever wrote that up did a great job. Yeah, because that that's that's something they knew that's the an experience. That's exactly right what that's like. The yep. supermarket scene from that movie is the best. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I I have a favor to ask. Well, I have a I have a question to ask of you. Um, do you happen to know who the patron saint of POWs is? No. His name is St. Francis of Assisi. Well, I know who he is, but I didn't know that he covered down on that. Do you know why he's the patron saint of POWs? No. Because before he was a saint, he was a POW. He is the only one that survived. Really? 
Yes. I carry them around in my wallet. Marcus, I actually uh, my rosary and everything was delivered from Francis. So I, I uh, but I didn't know that. So I even studied the saints like hardcore too. Yeah, I mean, he did. I mean, like I really studied for his confirmation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of them. Picked, um, Saint Peter. Well, I'm St. Peter, but I, you know, I, yeah, it's, but um, I, Francis so, was my man, and well, I'll tell you why because of the warrior part, because he was a badass. Yeah. So and he his, was his, captured, his, yeah. and along with his friends, he watched the rest of his friends die in captivity. The okay. only reason why he was kept alive and given any food at all was because his family was rich. And so um, when they finally bargained for his release, he uh, came home and rejected his parents, their wealth, and uh, rejected their lifestyle and everything. It, and obviously he was suffering yeah. from post-traumatic stress. Um, and he had a best friend that stuck with him. And uh, you're probably familiar with the story of him stripping off all of his clothes. Yeah. <clears throat> and renouncing, like becoming, taking a vow of extreme poverty. Right. And uh, um, his first, his first uh, protege was his best friend. His best friend was like, "Hey, I'm not even, I'm not even part of this church thing, but I love you, and I'm not going to ever leave your side. And so uh, I'm, I'll be, I'll, I'm going to do all this with you. And that's what started the Franciscan order. But without Saint Clair. There'd be oh, no St. Francis, yeah, oh, yeah. right? And so I went through the St. Francis of Assisi retreat in Scottsdale. It is led by a two-tour Franciscan priest who'd been in Fallujah twice, uh -huh. both times. Marine, He's right? Marine. He is a little bitty guy that is hard as woodpecker lips. Sure, yeah. And uh, he's the only guy that ever beat me on a run that I'm aware of. <laughs> when I was an actor, I didn't even know who he was. He whipped my ass in Okinawa. Um, and I tried to reel him in, man, but I yeah. just couldn't. Anyways, he makes a retreat, a pilgrimage to a sissy. What do you think about taking Travis and a couple of your friends and we do a little film crew and we make a pilgrimage documentary and we give it back to the, to the oh, to military them? or even to the Catholic Church? But... We know I do something like that, bro. I got nothing but time now. You know? Oh, do you really? <laughs> Turns out I do too. I, I just mean, quit my job. Come to find out, you hear that you Amazon? Know, we, we're we're out of a job, you know. Kind of, so our chosen profession's gone. We're yeah. in this part of our life. I mean, whatever you want to do, you know, it's kind of. So that's Marcus. Uh, for many years uh, after, so I got medboarded. Uh, I couldn't stay in. All guys did. I, I got All I got beat to the hell. I, death, yeah. I almost got. Yeah, that's the only reason why I even got a chance to stay in the military for any time longer was through Exos yeah. or API. Uh, but, Which is exactly what it was designed for. Yeah, and they were literally like, I was the oldest guy. It was the ACC Air Combat Command test case. And they were like, why is this guy going? He's so old. Yeah. And they're like, if we can make this guy, you know, turn him into Steve Austin, you know, six million dollars. Because that's what we're trying to do there. Right. And so, when those older guys, they're not going to go, go out. They're going to go back in. Yeah. And, it, and I came out of there, and I was smoking the young kids, and I, I mean, and I like kicking footballs and shit. And they were like, "What? Places on point. How, how? How in the hell did this just happen?" And they're like, "Okay, but um, I confess, the uh, it would likely be next year um, because they're they've got one queued up. They're leaving here shortly. Mm -hmm. But uh, for many years, I struggled with this mental. I, I struggled with something I, I I can only describe as I needed greenery. And I can't, I can't, it was a, it was like a wound that I could not heal. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't describe it. I lacked the words, uh, but it was something that now I can tell you was in my soul. And I went through intensive therapy. And in the course of the therapy, it, it hit me that it likely has something to do with a wound, a moral wound, somewhere along the line that I picked up and I've suppressed. I inherited or something, but it almost feels as though like I want to return to the garden, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. my original state of grace. And I'm absolutely certain, I'm telling you this, I believe with all my heart that St. Francis of Assisi, that is why he had the bond with nature, mm -hmm. is he was looking to, to heal from his captivity 
and his the way to do it was through the garden, the nature, yeah. through animals and plants and mm -hmm. things like that. That's what this place is. Yeah, and that's what I've been trying to. I've been uh, not. Uh, we're on the path for as well. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you so much for yep. coming on and telling your story. And it's really incredible. Who's talking about I've never heard of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this is a freaking overview, man. You yeah. can't believe it. Thank you guys for listening in another week. And uh, we'll see you next week. If you did like this episode, please give it a thumbs up. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. So buckle up, Buttercup.